Okay, so hello everyone. So uh, welcome to our uh, uh, this new semester's Rutgers Efficient AI seminar talk. And today we're very glad to have Professor Wu Jiawen from NCSU to give us this talk. And uh, Professor Wen is an associate professor in the Department of the Computer Science at North Carolina State University. He earned a PhD degree from the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, he's the, the very early student of Professor Yiran Chen. And his research, current research efforts include the efficient, reliable, secure, and the privacy preserving computing, particularly from the aspects of the software, hardware co-design and the electrical design automation, as well as their application to embedded IoT, smart medical and intelligent cyber physical systems. And his research group has published extensively on CS ranking conferences, including DAC, ICAD, Micro, HPCA, Auckland uh, Security in Europe's ICML, CVPR, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and uh, Professor Wen received the best paper nomination from all of the, the four major EDA conferences, the DAC, ICCAD, DATE, ASP-DAC. And he's currently serving as the associate editor for the Neuro Neuro Computing and IEEE Circuits and System Magazine. And uh, recently he got the NSF Faculty Career Award and the congratulations to Wenjie. Wenjie. Yeah. Okay, okay, so now let's welcome Professor Wen to give us this talk. Okay, thank you, Bob, for the introduction. So uh, today I'm going to uh, share some of our past research and also the recent research regarding how to uh, design, you know, the efficient, uh, secure, and the private uh, machine learning uh, systems. So here is the I mean, the outline of today's talk. So first, I'm going to give a very quick introduction about intelligent data processing and uh, specifically the application requirements and the design challenges and uh, also, you know, where is our research. And then I'm going to using three uh, examples to uh, show that how actually we are thinking about uh, designing the efficient, private and secure machine learning systems, especially from the, you know, the communication, computation, and also constraint aspect. And uh, then I'm going to conclude uh, this talk. So if you look at the today's, I mean, computing uh, uh, landscape, so AI actually uh, comes in all size and shapes from the cloud, you know, to the low end IoT and sensing devices. So with state driven AI, so it has found, you know, broad applications in agriculture, let's say irrigation and military object detection and power system control and also medical and finance and so on and so forth. So, but in order to make the, you know, the uh, intelligent data processing really useful for, you know, practical applications, so they have to satisfy certain requirements. So the first very important thing is that the AI computing should be, you know, fast, which means like uh, it should be low uh, latency and also the accuracy should be as high as possible. This is particular, you know, for many applications like real-time application like drone, object detection, UAVs, right? On the other hand, the as the popularity of the machine learning service, especially machine learning as a service on the cloud, so security and privacy concern have, you know, draw a lot of attentions. So especially for many uh, applications such as you know medical image, uh, like segmentation and financial uh, training and those and also recommendation systems. So uh, we believe that current you know, intelligent data processing uh, actually facing, still face many challenges to make it, you know, really useful. So one thing actually I said, as I mentioned before, the efficiency. So efficiency means that you have to achieve low latency and also energy efficient. In the meanwhile, you have to uh, maintain the accuracy. There are many, I mean, example solutions, for example, in, in the community. So we have done a lot of work in order to accelerate the AI computation. So that's more from the computation aspect. 
So basically the key thing is that how we can fit the larger model into the small devices, especially for those devices with very limited computing resources, for example, energy harvesting devices, right? So on the other hand, we also uh, believe that uh, there are many, I mean, uh, devices like low end IoT and sensing devices, which do not have the capability to perform the on device inference. So there is a strong need that you have to communicate send the data, you know, to somewhere else, such as cloud or edge, to finish the AI inference. So from that aspect, we think that the communication instead of computation, AI computation becomes a bottleneck. We actually started to look at this issue, I think back to maybe 2018. So we actually developed the very first, I mean, uh, compression technique dedicated to machine learning system to address uh, this issue. So later we are going to uh, show you some of the our, you know, uh, research uh, in, in this direction. The second thing is, as I mentioned before, the privacy actually becomes more important, especially, you know, for the, so nowadays, you know, AI actually rely on large amount of data. On the other hand, there are many law regulations in Europe, in US, right? So how to protect the data, right? User data when they have the inference and, and, the, and on the other hand, the model IP providers, they try to, you know, protect their IP. So basically, this is also a very important issue. So there are many example solutions in the community, for example, differential privacy. So the key idea is that you try to add the noise, especially Gauss noise, so into the training stage. So adding it in the gradient every iteration, and there is a privacy budget. So theoretically, it can guarantee that, okay, so the user data will have the differential privacy, okay? So there are also other methods like a cryptographic method, like a homomorphic inflation, as you may have heard before, all right? And also the MPC multi-party computing try to address issue and also feather running is another. So try to keep the data on the device, of course. So feather running itself has many, I mean, issues like uh, not just the pure, it's, it's quite private because you still send the information to the uh, central server, so there will be some information leakage, right? And also hardware security solution, such as trust execution environment, Intel SGX, ARM trust zone. So, but achieving privacy in the context of machine learning is kind of expensive. So uh, one thing you can imagine is that there are tremendous communication a computation and the memory cost in addition to already, you know, very memory and the computation intensive machine learning inference. Because uh, take the uh, homomorphic insurance as an example, because you have to map the data into the, uh, you know, high order polymorphic degree coefficient. And then many computation is based on the, you know, polynomial degree multiplication, those things. It's very, very memory computation intensive. The communication is that if you involve the multiple party, especially multiple computing, it's biggest becomes a big issue. So in, in other words, so basically in order to achieve the privacy, you have to sacrifice something. So especially accuracy or latency. So it's very difficult to achieve the trade-off. Okay. And security aspect. So as you have already heard, you know, before, so there are many, I mean, uh, machine learning related uh, security or attack problems, right? So for them, adversary attack and also the fault injection attack from the hardware side. So basically there are many already, a lot of solutions like, you know, algorithm adversary training and uh, hardware redundance and security, like let's say TEE. And also there are many uh, detection recovery solutions but uh, what we think about is that uh, security in terms of the machine learning, especially for many sensitive applications with limited resources, it's quite challenging. So one thing is that you do have a lot of enlarged attack service because now you connect to the physical world, right? And the attack from the, can be from the physical world, can be from the 
you know, the, the, the hardware side, right? So, and also usually you have a very strict defense budget because remember running the machine learning inference or training is quite memory and computation intensive. So if you want to achieve some kind of, you know, security on top of that, you have to think about the defense budget. So how much you are going to pay. So here it could be the memory, it could be computation resource. So eventually it will be translated into, you know, the, let's say the inference, the latency, those aspects. So again, so it's not an easy way to achieve a good trade-off among these three, you know, aspects. So, so in the past several years, so our group is mainly focusing on the, uh, you know, the software hardware co-design and design automation. And uh, by considering many of the, uh, you know, resource constraints. So we have done a lot of work on the efficient and reliable computing. So here it could be like, uh, you know, using the FPGA to accelerate the machine learning inference and also uh, processing memory, especially processing memory, you know, reliability issues. And also we have done uh, many interesting work on the security AI. So uh, basically recently we, we, we published one paper on the use of security is talking about how we can actually proactively avoid or detecting or recovery the, uh, you know, AI model when there is a fault injection attack and with a very, very low cost, which we will discuss later if we have time. And the third direction is privacy preserving. We started this project, uh, I think uh, one year ago, actually. So we have done many uh, interesting things, especially from the differential privacy aspect and also from the homework inclusion aspect. So in today, so uh, we are going to give three examples. So first thing is that first topic is that how we can actually improve the uh, communication efficiency, which, you know, bottlenecks the uh, remote AI processing for those low-end IoT and sensing devices. So specifically, we actually uh, developed the very first, we call that machine vision guided compression technique. So instead of human vision guided, so for the low latency inference on the edge and the cloud coverage uh, inference. So uh, yeah, this is the work actually back to the 2018. So, and uh, the second topic will be how we can actually, you know, accelerate the private machine learning inference. Specifically, we are using the CKKS, which is a leveled homomorphic inclusion technique. So here we actually provide two examples to demonstrate the idea. The first thing is about how we can actually uh, uh, the work is about the cryptographic GCN. So how we can use the homomorphic inclusion to, you know, uh, encrypt the graph conversion neural net inference and take advantage of the sparsity matrix computation and cyber test encoding and sparsity to actually accelerate the inference. And on the other hand, we also look at the uh, conversion neural net inference and try to understand what are the key computation patterns there, you know, which is different from graph neural network and try to using the, you know, design philosophy, which is joint optimization of the side test encoding model sparsity and the computation aware, you know, pattern aware, you know, idea try to accelerate this machine learning inference. Okay. And the third topic, as I mentioned before, so we actually develop the very first proactive defense. Here, the keyword is proactive, which means that, that we actually try to design some, you know, weak point or honey part, which try to proactive attract this attacks instead of passively detect that. So in this way, we can recover the model easily in the real time with very, very low cost. So. So those work actually have been published, I mean, in those conference. So let's talk about the first, I mean, topic about machine learning, uh, machine learning guided. So as I mentioned before, so there are many, you know, data captured from the low end sensors, you know, devices, which they do not have the capability to do the inference locally. So they have to send the data to the cloud. So 
for a typical deep learning service, so it will consist two parts. I mean, one is communication latency. The second part is the computation, I mean, the AI inference. So if you look at the breakdown of the, I mean, the communication and the computation overhead, if you look at the figure, so as you can see that as the image size increase, okay, the communication latency will be increased proportionally, okay? But if you look at the inference at the cloud or on the GPU side of mobile, so it mostly remain unchanged. So that's one observation. The second observation is that if you compare the communication latency with that of computation latency on the cloud or on the you know the mobile GPU, even on the Wi-Fi condition. So basically, the inf uh, the communication latency actually takes over that. So if you further, the trend actually is more observed if we uh, look at the right table. So if you look at the computation, it's six millisecond, and if we look at the communication, depends on the image size. It could be from twenty four to one hundred twenty five. You can see there is a you know, unbalanced, you know, communication and computation uh, here. Actually, this is uh, based on the data published in the SPARS 2017. So we, uh, in 2018, we start to look at the issue because we figured out that there are many, I mean, research already doing on the AI hardware acceleration, you know, try to reduce uh, the computation overhead. Uh, uh, you know, on the hardware, but there are little, there is little attention on this side. So, uh, one, you know, typical variable solution is trying to, let's try to make the image smaller or make the data smaller, right? Using the, let's say, compression technique, try to reduce that significant. In the meanwhile, we have the requirement that you have to maintain the accuracy of the machine learning service, try to balance the communication and the computation overhead so so we actually started the very first you know popular and very simple example so jpeg so we actually did a lot of tests about jpeg so if you look at the figure in the left side so we figured out that if you compress the jpeg image significantly during the testing right of course you can argue that Okay, you training using the test compressed data, you know, testing is, we actually did a lot of investigations about these things. So we figured out that if you want to compress the data significantly aggressively, so you can find if the compression ratio equals to five, the VGE 16, the network, essentially, you know, the accuracy can be dropped, dropped about 9%. So 9% is very, very significant as I show. Here, so it's almost offset the network upgrade, upgrade. For example, from the AlexNet to the Google Linux, you pay more layers, more MAC operations, but the accuracy is down. So, uh, so this means that the JPEG may not be a good, I mean, solution if you want to compress the data, just the, you know, dedicated for the machine learning inference. So. So what we did is that we tried to develop the very first, we call it machine vision guided compression framework that is catered to the machine learning system. So specifically we have two goals. So first we want to achieve much higher compression rate than the existing compression framework. And in the meanwhile, we want to guarantee the quality of search which is accuracy. On the other hand, we would like to see whether those techniques can be easily deployed in the existing systems, such as, you know, sensors, cameras, because uh, those actually devices already have those, you know, compression engines such as JPEG. So if we can just slightly change that a little bit and then make it machine vision guided and, you know, with the guarantee of the compression rate and the uh, quality of service, then that will be great. So this is the motivation to achieve this goal. Actually, we did several things. One thing is that we do need to understand the, you know, how actually human vision system and the machine learning system view the quality of the image. Because here, very important information is that uh, the 
data is going to be processed by machine learning systems. And this trend, I mean, will be uh, more obvious in the near future. So basically machine to machine communication, right? So machine learning system actually take care of image, not the human. But if you look at the existing compression framework, most of them are designed based on human vision. So for example, PSNR is the evaluation metrics, one of the evaluation metrics, right? Then what we did, the second thing is that based on the understanding of the difference between human vision system and deep learning system, we try to re-architecture or just change it slightly for the Japan-based compression technique and make it DNA oriented. And of course, we did some kind of some of the optimization, like function optimization, try to, you know, reach high accuracy and also the, you know, uh, compression rate. So if you look at the, if you look at the JPEG, so the key component here is the quantization. Essentially, the basic flow is, uh, flow is that you decouple the image eight by eight block and then you do the DCT transformation and apply the quantization, you know, tables. And the remaining part essentially is just a lossless. So uh, the key idea is that you have to apply the quantization technique in order to achieve the compression, right? So here the quantization essentially, especially this critical table is based on the assumption that the human vision system essentially is more interesting or more sensitive to the low frequency component instead of high frequency component. Then if you want to achieve the high compression rate, you just slow away high frequency component and maintain or keep the low frequency component. But if you look at a deep learning system, so let's just using a simple, you know, illustration, assume you have a pixel XK. And this SK actually, if you do the DCT transformation, you can decouple it into the six, four, you know, different frequencies. Here, C, K, I, J essentially is DCT coefficient and B, I, J is the corresponding, I mean, basic function for the 64 different frequencies. So if you derive, simply derive the gradient of the DNN function respect to the basis function B, I, J, here B, I, J essentially you can Think about it, it's just the frequency component. So here, the left part indicates the importance of the frequency component, you know, for the DNN classification. So if you further derive that, you can see that essentially it is determined by two, I mean, in a cost grain manner, it determined by two factors. One factor is how important this pixel could be. The second is that the uh, coefficient of this uh, DCT coefficient of CKIJ. Okay, so uh, think about that. If you have a large, so normally if you have a large, this, the left part, importance of the pixel could be, I mean, uh, importance of pixel respect to the DN function, uh, this could be changed, it depends on the data, right? But the CKIJ essentially is a coefficient. So if you have a larger CKIJ naively, so so in some sense, it in, indicates this frequency component is more important. So here we actually have several observations. One thing is that DNS can respond to any important frequency component precisely. It's not just, a, it's different from the human vision because human vision is just to say, okay, if the BIJ, we think it's high frequency component, it's not important, right? BIJ, if it's low frequency component, it's important. So if you further look at this example here, so, so if you have an image input here, right, you just arbitrarily remove, you know, some of the, you know, high frequency component, you can see that DNN system, you know, can be easily distorted. This also, you know, have been demonstrated in many, I mean, security research like adversary example attack. You can see that, Essentially, from the human aspect, this two image does not have any change, okay? But from the machine learning aspect, this is not the right way, okay? So basically, if you're using the existing compression technique, so some important features may be filled up the human vision-based compression.
Okay, so that means we might need to rethink about the quantization step. Of course, so it's very difficult, you know, to precisely evaluate, you know, the compression ratio and the accuracy. I mean, you want to uh, do some link, some you want to make some connection between the compression ratio and the inference accuracy. It's not an it's a non-trivial problem. So what we did is that we actually using some a uh, basic concept like a data-driven idea. So here we try to sample some data. We assume we capture some data from the sensor, you know. Then first step we did is that we do the quick frequency feature analysis. So here essentially we just uh, try to characterize the, you know, the uh, DCT coefficient here. And then we use this, we use, we characterize an important metric for each component frequency component and as use this important metrics and generate quantization tables for each data. And then we replace the JPEG, I mean quantization table, and then transmit to, to DNN model to do the inference. So this is the, the general idea. So a high level institution could be like this. So First, assume you have a 256 by 256 your know, image samples. So you apply an eight by eight, I mean DCT convert uh, like uh, DCT for each small block, and then you characterize 64 different frequency components. And then since you have about 1K this kind of blocks, you get the I mean, the pretty much the distribution of statistical information of each frequency component. And we actually look at some of theories about how important of usually the standard deviation of this coefficient could be a good metric to indicate how important it could be based on the previous, I mean, uh, cost grain analysis. Then we actually map this uh, based on the standard deviation we map it into three different range. Let's say low frequency component, medium frequency component, high frequency component. For low frequency component, we just use a smaller quantization step. For high frequency component, we use a large quantization step. Uh, so here, uh, one difference, uh, one thing you have to uh, think about is that we actually establish, uh, you know, some function to make it simple and map it to to the like quantization step, generate quantization table. Another thing is that here the LF, MF, and HF are different, I mean, from the aspect of human vision systems. So in this way, you can actually uh, make it tailored, you know, for the machine learning system. So this is, I mean, the overall idea is kind of very uh, simple and the technique is not so difficult, but, you know, the here we actually achieve a very good, I mean, performance at the initial stage. If you look at the evaluation results, you can see that uh, the deep and JPEG, we call deep and JPEG, it's quite, uh, you know, it can achieve about 3.5 uh, times, uh, you know, more compression rate than the JPEG. On the other hand, we almost maintain the uh, same accuracy as the original image. But of course, we made some comparison with those naive methods, like remove just remove hybrid components and using the same quantization tape, you know, uh, value for every you know position. So basically, we did a lot of research. If you look at the uh, generality, you can see that we actually evaluate this method across different neural network and also different compression rate. You know, for you can see that our a uh, uh, method always delivers the best accuracy and the compression efficiency. So regardless of the neural network structure. So as again, as you can see that as uh, our previous approach essentially does not relate it to the neural network function, right? So this is just a, you know, a starting point, give people think about whether, you know, the, uh, you have to think about the, you know, data compression technique when you're facing the, you know, uh, the uh, machine learning inference. So uh, we actually address the very important uh, data offloading problem, bottlenecking the cloud and based inference for IoT devices. And this is also the very first uh, innovative design based on the concept of machine 
uh, vision. And we think this technique can be easily integrated into many, I mean, uh, CPS sensors. Of course, after our work, there are many new work based on this conception. Okay, so uh, one example is that in the network community, people are thinking about, you know, how we can actually jointly optimize the, you know, the compression and the task, right? Together, this is all, we also did that. So we actually apply this technique to also many uh, real applications like uh, medical image segmentation. So here, JPEG to 3D, JPEG 1000, just an example because they're using the DWP transformation. We use a similar concept and together with the Universal Not Them, we published one paper in CVPR. So basically the we achieve the similar, I mean, the uh, performance improvement in terms of inference latency because 3D image segmentation is, we assume it's, uh, you know, uh, conducted in the cloud and the image size could be very uh, large. So this is uh, the first part. So we just want to let you know that uh, there are many interesting things that can be started in terms of the machine learning, especially we need to think about the, you know, revisit the existing techniques. Okay, so let's talk about the switch gear, talk about something, you know, more uh, mathematical side. So uh, homomorphic inference, neural neck inference. So privacy preserving, uh, you know, is very important for many applications. So you, for example, here you have the, you know, hospital, they have a lot of patients data, so they, need to have the cloud server to perform some kind of you know medical images analysis and the financial the financial bank also has this kind of they do those clients they 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 share the common thing so they do not want their data to be you know that can be seen by the third party right on the other hand it involves multi-party so privacy preserving is kind of very uh, essential. There are many, I mean, uh, techniques or solutions here. As you can see, so one thing is about the cryptographic approach, as I mentioned. So homomorphic function, which we will discuss, and also garbage circuit, MPC, and the secure uh, processor like Intel's SGX. And uh, the second approach is more from the theoretic side, perturbation approach, so which is differential privacy. So as I mentioned before, so the biggest challenge for the differential privacy is the uh, very bad trade-off between the utility and the privacy, okay? So basically the model essentially is not uh, going to achieve a high accuracy when you inject the noise during the training for each iteration. So people are thinking about ways to, you know, improve the utility significantly. So um, although this differential privacy, why people started this? Because it's widely deployed in the many, I mean, database, okay, in curl started, but in terms of the machine learning, it still take a longer time. So we actually published one interesting paper in the uh, this year's uh, IEEE security and privacy. So here we actually propose a very different, uh, I mean, a framework. Uh, compared with the existing approach like DPSGD proposed that Google and, you know, OpenAI. So their idea is trying to adding the noise in the time domain. I mean, so that's why, I mean, the accuracy is very difficult to improve. Here, we actually alternatively, we try to inject the differential privacy noise into a more compressed domain, which is the spectral domain, okay? So in this way, our method actually, uh, you know, achieve the significant utility improvement. In some cases, especially for transfer learning cases, we even, you know, achieve the similar accuracy as the non-private version. So which means that this technique maybe in some sense is useful. But again, this is another angle, you know, try to rethink that problem. Of course, the third solution is fast learning. So I'm not going to discuss this. So let's take a look at the, you know, homomorphic function. So CKKS essentially is a state of the level that actually, if you look at this process, it sounds very complicated, but here the general information you can think about is if I have a, a data or, you know, input data, right? So what I try to do is that I'm going to encode the data into the coefficient of some polynomial polynomials. And then 
This is what we call encoding step. And then we use some public key to encrypt inc inc this polynomial, okay? And, and also we have the random polynomials to edit that. And during decryption, we just using the secret key to decrypt that. From this process, if you look at the below example, you can see that if the original data is eight bits, so if assume your polynomial degree, you know, is two to 15. So you can see that the orange data is 32 kilobytes. But after this encryption, those operations, you can see that the data can be increased about, you know, orders of magnitude. So thousand times, which means that if you think about in the machine learning domain, right? If you look at the feature max, it's already very expensive, but here, if you further thinking about the privacy preserving from the cryptographic, the memory and the computation overhead can be significantly increased. Okay, so for the homework encryption technique, so many people have known that the key idea is that the client will have an encryption engine in their end and then encrypt the data and send the cipher text to the you know machine learning and service that's on the cloud, and then you know the uh, client, uh, sorry, the server will, you know, perform the computation directly on the site text. So without, you know, uh, looking into the print text. So there are many advantages. One thing is that you can do the direct computation on the site text. Okay. So once the computation is done, the client, uh, the server just sends the increment data to the client and the client has the private key they just decrypted, which is very secure because you don't need to share any information with anyone, right? And it also minimize, you know, the client server information exchange because it's just one time. Send the data to the server and server send encrypt data back to the client, right? And it has the theoretical guaranteed client data privacy. But on the other hand, it has very expensive, you know, computation overhead. Think about, your data now is mapped to the polynomial degree and those polynomial coefficient essentially is multiple bit, right? So many of the computation is the integer multiplication, it's the bit number could be very large, so it's very expensive. And in particular, there are many, I mean, uh, special operations in the encryption domain. Here, I just give you an example. You can see that some of the operations like rotation, ciphertext rotation and ciphertext multiplication, the latency single operation could be much, much larger than just the addition of those operations, okay? It's even close to, you know, 80 millisecond, just one, you know, operation. This is very expensive. On the other hand, because uh, the currently, I mean, homo function, they do require the bootstrapping many schemes, but bootstrapping is really, really too expensive and people, as, as as far as now, so there is no you know companies can provide the good bootstrapping. I mean solution is too slow. So basically here, what we focus on is the CKKs which are leveled. So we do not involve bootstrapping step. So we want to uh, avoid this. But on the other hand, because you don't have the bootstrapping, so the multi capable depths you can support is very limited. Okay, and also. The, lat the latency is quite large when you apply those techniques directly. So here, if you look at SqueezeNet 164, you know, second, which is, you know, far more than those, I mean, influence in the non infusion domain. So this is, I mean, the major challenge issue. So if you look at the CKKS level, the CKKS technique, there are like four techniques defined, uh, four operations defined in the encryption domain. So one thing is about ciphertext multiplication, okay? And the other one is plain text by ciphertext. Okay, also ciphertext plus ciphertext. And also rotation. Here, if you look at the rotation operation, it's kind of very simple. It's like shift the register, I mean, in the hardware, but when it's not like that, rotation actually involves lots of, I mean, key switching operations. So every rotation, let's say rotation, rotated by one, rotated by two, rotated for three. So they all involve key switching operations. The key is kind of very expensive. If you look at the results we proposed before, so essentially the 
uh, rotation operation is much longer than any of the operations here. Of course, it's a similar level as a ciphertext multiplication. Okay, so if we further profiling that using a neural network model or just one neural net layer, let's say 64 channel convolution, you know, three by three, you can see that the mutation almost occupy, you know, two thirds of the latency. Okay, here we assume that we don't have the expensive bootstrapping. Okay, here we assume the planet data is included, but the model in the server essentially is a print text. So you can see that the ciphertext multiplication does not have a lot of, I mean, it's only occupy a small amount of the uh, overhead. So definitely we need to find a way to reduce the rotation operations here. So here we actually provide some of the, our thoughts in the, you know, uh, first the current research, actually they just uh, simplify the HE ML computation pattern as the one time security, like the matrix matrix multiplication or matrix vector multiplication. So they do not consider that essentially in the machine learning system, it's one layer by language, one layer processing. So you have to think about the processing is in, you know, sequentially one layer. It's not just one time. And on the other hand, the many of the designs, they don't consider the ciphertext encoding. So ciphertext encoding is just based on the, you know, the, okay, it's a general matrix, match multiplication, match vector multiplication. But here we want to uh, provide some sorts of that. First, the different MM models, they have different computation patterns in terms of the privacy preserving. So especially for example, CNNs, the 3D convolution could be a very different pattern. And compared with the graph neural net, you have adjacent matrix. So matrix matrix multiplication is the key. So basically, uh, which means that for the CNNs, you really need to focus on the how you can actually address overhead of the 3D convolution, okay? When, when it is incubated. And in graph neural network, you have to think about, okay, matrix, matrix multiplication, because it happens in every layer, you really need to take care of it. So the question here is how you can actually design different self-text encoding method, which take advantage of single instruction multi-data, you know, to speed up that. The, set, the, the last thing is that uh, the model sparsity, you know that it's already widely proved in the inclusion domain, uh, in the non inquiry inference, right? But here the question is that what if, how actually an inquiry inference can take advantage of the model sparsity, okay, to improve that. So to summarize, so our philosophy is, you have to think about how you can actually uh, design the ciphertext encoding based on the pattern, okay, computation pattern bottleneck. And also you have to think about how you can actually take advantage of sparsity to fully explore single instruction multi-data for speed up. Here we are considering that the uh, ML engine is performed, I mean, the incumbent service is performed in the CPU, not in the GPU, okay. So let's take a look at the, you know, the first example, which is spec inclusion CNN. So here the left part is just an on input in, uh, conclusion. You can see that assume you have F output channels, right? You do the conversion, you got F output channels, you have F output parameters, right? But if you encode this, you know, channel feature into the ciphertext, okay? If you want to get the, you know, the F output ciphertext simultaneous feature map, encrypted ciphertext simultaneously, you have to rotate this input feature map, you know, F minus one times. So here the general idea is that you have to rotate this ciphertext F minus one times, and also you rotate this weight matrix also the similar way. So in that sense, which means that in the original, I mean, the unimplement conversion, you just need to keep one copy of the, I mean, the feature map. But here you can see that you have to have F minus one additional copy and the rotated version of the convolution in order to 
make the you know include conversion work. Okay, so this is we call the auto rotation. Okay, multi channel conversion. And if you further zoom into the single dimension conversion, you can see that if you have a three by three, you know, input which is input ciphertext and a three by three conversion kernel, when you do the conversion, you will need to involve about eight times rotation again. So because here you can see that if you do the rotation in the in the middle position, you can see that it will be automatically become A1 by K1 plus A2 by K2. So this is in order to get the data simultaneously. So this is we call the unknown rotation, okay? So you have to involve K square minus one in order to So in overall, so the rotation number will become F minus one by K square by one. So which is very, very costly. So that's why actually there is a trend, there is a strong need that you have to take care of the rotation operations. It's not just, the, you know, it's really very memory and computation intensive. So how we actually address this problem, I just to give a general idea, okay, here because of time. So what we did is that we actually uh, here assume for the general, you know, HE conversion, you have encode channel one and channel two, you know, feature map into one ciphertext, channel three and channel four into another ciphertext. Now, if you want to do the, con uh, you want to get multi-channel results, here you can see that the CH1 and CH2 ciphertext need to rotate once, and CH3 and CH4 ciphertext need to rotate another time, and then multiply the corresponding plain text and adding them together, you will get four output. So in this case, you will involve two rotations, right? But we actually take some uh, like insight from the group conversions. So our idea is that we just using the group conversion idea. Here, we decouple the channel into two parts, group one and group two. So the, for the group one, you just, when you calculate output channel one, you just use involve CH1 and CH2, okay? So for group two, when you calculate the output feature, it involves CH3 and CH4 information. But when we do the ciphertext encoding, we actually interleave the encode that, which means CH3 and CH, CH1 and CH3 are encoded as the same ciphertext. CH2 and CH4 are encoded in ciphertext as into the same text. When we do the multiplication, since CH1 and CH3, they do not need to, you know, to submission together, you know, in order to get one output as like, like this case, CH1 and CH2 need to multiply and add it together. Like here, CH1 and CH3 is basically decoupled. So in this way, we actually, we do not in, need to involve any, you know, rotation operations. We just simply adding them together, we, we got four out of the channels. Similar. Of course, there is some discussions about how you actually, you know, how many groups you have and how you actually group those information. So here is a general idea. So in this way, you actually take advantage of the group conversion and decouple the you know, channel information, which will be involved in the conversion operation into different subtypes. You can avoid the rotation operations. And we also uh, zoom into the, I mean, the inside the, uh, uh, the metrics, uh, inside the, inner convolution. So here just one dimension in convolution. So here the general idea is that we try to decouple, I mean, we try for the same set text, we try to apply the same, I mean, sparsity patterns. In this way, we can reduce the number of rotations involved in the, you know, matrix matrix multiplication. Here, just an example, original, we need to have uh, uh, eight, uh, uh, like, uh, eight uh, rotation times. Here we only need to have two. So this is a general idea. So I'm just going to show you some results. So here you can see that our results actually improve, you know, the uh, compared with baseline and state of art work so significantly. So eight times, even considering the bootstrapping, we actually did some estimation. If some network less risk net 20, we have some bootstrapping. So we can see there is still improvement. If you look at the 
the sparsity patterns you can see here that essentially the same group they have the same I mean convolutional uh, sparsity patterns and here group one and group two they share the same so so if you look at the uh, original I mean uh, sparsity patterns you hear that original uh, uh, non-structure pooling and structure pooling and also structure pooling channel wise you can see that although they have a tremendous, I mean, sparsity pattern, but if you look at the latency breakdown, they really do not improve the latency, okay? So that means when you involve the sparsity, so you, when you consider the private inference, you have to really rethink about the, computer, uh, I mean, the sparsity patterns. So another example I'm going to quickly talk about is the adjacent matrix. So here, graph neural network, you can see that a, X, W. A is a JSON match. X is a feature, encrypted feature. W is a weight, right? So here you can see that A, X essentially is a very important component here. If you further look at the uh, results we provide, so you can see that for a particular layer, if you do not involve any matrix multiplication here, matrix multiplication, adjacent matrix, is the computation of head compared with this Involving the matrix multiplication, you can see that the overhead number of homomorphic inclusion uh, increase significantly, which means that the matrix multiplication really is a big issue in graph convolution neural network. On the other hand, if you look at the state of art solutions, usually they just apply a mask to the matrix, I mean, to the sparse matrix A, and they will increase, I mean, the levels consume the levels of the multiplicative. So in this way, their method is not quite, you know, optimized for the GCN. So the latency is still quite high. So we actually started the uh, state of the ciphertext encoding method, we call it low major encoding method. If you look at this standard approach, so each feature map, we just encode it to a ciphertext. And then when you multiply with this address in the matrix, so this is a feature map encoded, this is A, which is, I mean, which is the plain text. So you can see that they will involve about, you know, seven times, uh, six times rotation actually here. So this is unavoidable, okay? But if we rethink the problem, if we incorporate data into, you know, this way, so we actually include the data in a column wise, okay, and then, can uh, apply the different batch of data within the one cipher text. And then we decouple the matrix here, address the matrix into a specialized structure. So one way is that we make sure that each column you have only one valid item here, right? And then you decouple it into two. Then you just do the multiplication very simply for each column 1593 so multiply this a11 okay and then a32 which is the third row you just apply this method you adding them together directly you don't need to involve any location so in this way we can actually re-encode re the method and then decouple the mass sparse matrix and then we eliminate the rotation operations okay so this is just a general idea. We actually did some uh, experiments in this part. We found some speed up uh, about three times, especially when the batch size increase. So again, so this is the very first HE-based deep GCN inference. So improve the, I mean, the uh, memory uh, usage. So this is a fresh angle to advance the research on accelerating HE-based uh, private inference on the in the machine learning domain. So especially we are thinking about the computation pattern aware for different networks is very important for the coding. And also you have to rethink about the, how to leverage the matrix sparsity, okay? And also in particular, critical GCN is very first, I mean, benchmark for HE-based private GCN inference. I think we, I don't have too much time. I just quickly go through the last one. So. Last one is about the constraint aware. So we are actually targeting about the, how we can actually defend thing against the fault injection attack, which you have already uh, run before. I mean, maybe so the particular, the attack is targeted on the hardware friendly models. Okay. And it's quantized model. You just uh, flip a few bits in the memories, you reload hammer, and then you can 
democratic destroy, destroy the model accuracy significantly. For example, here is the example is you just using 10 bit out of billion bits, you just you know make the model as a random guess. Okay. So here, if you we actually provide some of the uh, attacks using the different C. So here the secret actual attack have you can see that the none of the bit flip actually happens in the same layer. So here an iteration tells you that the bit flip in the weights could happen in any layer, any weights. Okay. So there is no common, I mean, things depends on the uh, knowledge an attack will have. Okay. So uh, in other words, so there are two, you have too many weights here, right? There are too many vulnerable points and it's very difficult to predict, you know, which bit flip chain the attack will take. Okay. So the, but as an ideal defense, you have to have the real time detection and recovery and it should guarantee the accuracy and also the cost should be very low. On the other hand, if attack knows some of the knowledge or even know all of your defense knowledge, so it can still, you know, achieve the resilience. So this is a goal. So which we call the, when facing adaptive attack, it's very important your defense can still work, survive in that environment. So we actually started some of the technique like existing algorithm adversary training. So as you know that because the bit flip happens in the weight bit. So there are too many, too large search space. It's, it's not going to work like the input data has a limited dimension, right? The second solution is how about hardware security solution. But the problem is that if you put the model into the trust exclusion environment, the performance will be not good. And also there are some side channel attack in, you know, existing even for the TE environment. And also the, another method is runtime for detection and the mitigation. So the question here is that you have a large search space here. You don't know which bit flip, you know, bit flip chain the attack will use. So you either you keep the model entirely and compare the model. If the model is very large bit by bit, it will be very costly. On the other hand, if you just the kind of partial detection, let's say you just characterize sensitive layers, I mean, sensitive bits, but the, this is not going to work for advanced attack. If they know some of the information, you know, here you, you, you actually, you put detection there and I just try to find another path to bypass it, right? So, so it's the problem is more like, you know, you find a needle in the hex cell. Okay, so what we did is uh, the idea is that we try to using the honeypot idea. The key is that we intentionally embedded some weak point into the neural network models and disguided it as a honey. And once attack actually try to find some bit flip chains, okay, they will most likely go to some of the honey, okay? If they bypass this, all these honeys, in the worst case, they will need to find a longer path in order to destroy the model, which means a lot of more and bit flips. So that's the key idea. So we actually using this simple example to tell you that, so the, you know, there are many shortcuts which can start, you know, which can reach the destination, right? But the question here is that you, where do you put the honey pot, right? So if you can put some honey pot here, let's say, and you also have put some detector here, then if the attacker goes, you know, some of the paths, you can easily detect that. If the attacker, you know, bit flip located in many of the, you know, in majority of the, you know, honey pot part, then you can recover that in real time. So that's a key idea. I'm not going to discuss more details. So just want to let you know that uh, we have some theoretical foundations about you know uh, how we actually can design the honeypot. So we actually focus on the neurons, okay? So focus on a few neurons only, disguided as most of vulnerable points using the activation you know, back preparation uh, theory. And on the other hand, we actually look at the, you know, the, uh, weight, so the let's say the filters or weights, the real you know uh, uh, location of the uh, DRAM memory. So basically, we try to assume this is a honey neural or honey neural honeyed feature map. So all the weights 
connected to this honey neuron will become the honey weights. And this honey weights will be distributed in, uh, you know, uh, the DRAM pages. Let's say one DRAM page is uh, 4K byte, right? You have multiple of these. So this honey weights should be distributed, you know, scaled to avoid this kind of, to improve the detection efficiency. So in this way, we can have a much smaller number of uh, weights because we just uh, focus on some, some honey neural related weights and narrow down the attack or defense service and efficient effective defense. And this is, I mean, how we actually embedded the, you know, uh, the, the honey neurons into the model. So there are two ways. So one way is the retraining. The other way is just, uh, you know, one shot. We don't require any retraining. And this is a typical flow. So we, if you have this honey neurons compared with this partial ways and also the full model, you can see that we may only use one or two neural or even 10 neurons. We just easily detect that and it's very extreme. And the, when, in, when for the real implementation, you can see that you can have the fault detection if directly embedded in the inference framework. For example, here, if you do the fault detection for this layer, if there is an arrow, we just, uh, you know, uh, 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 go here, right? And if recover that, if there is no arrow, we just go past this way, okay? So essentially you can use many a different method to do that. Let's say you can do the checksum or detection or even bit by bit comparison because you have significantly reduced the, I mean, the uh, detection service. So this is an example, uh, I mean, results. So in terms of time cost and storage overhead, you can see that it's very, very small. I mean, and also uh, we actually look at the number of detection rate. Almost in most of the cases, we have a very high detection rate. And uh, here we also discuss some of the advanced, uh, I mean, attacks, adaptive attacks, let's say bit level bypass. Let's say some bits actually attack knows that you are going to target some of the gradient bits is quite large because you may enlarge the activation value, right? So attack try to bypass that and using the low bits. And then you can see that the detection rate is still high if we actually, design some advanced chip door, let's say using more, I mean, honey neurons. And also we can do the higher mitigation rate. On the other hand, when attack bypass this, I mean, most sensitive bits. So what happens is that the number of bit flip. So the effort attack need to, you know, destroy the model is increased uh, significantly. We also have other, I mean, discussions about neural level bypass because we have designed honey neural, right? So if the attacker knows honey neural, the position, then what happens? Okay, so this is, I mean, the general. So overall, so we actually designed the real time, I mean, uh, product defense. So with very, very extremely low cost compared to ex existing uh, method, okay? So to conclude this talk, so I just want to say that AI actually triggers the revolution, you know, of the data processing for many, I mean, IoT and CPS applications. So if you want to really make use of technique, so there should be many, I mean, creative designs. On the other hand, so if you look at the existing technique, so compression is just one technique which is widely adopted in the community. So machine vision instead of human vision should be a new angle that you need to think about that, okay? And also efficient AI data processing, you know, with the guarantees of the privacy and security design is not a, a trivial problem. Essentially, it requires many efforts. So software, hardware, code design, you have to understand, you know, the protocol, the security problem. In the meanwhile, you have to understand computation patterns and the system constraints and neural net models. It's a joint effort. So with that, I want to, you know, conclude this talk. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Wu Jie. So thank you very much for this very interdisciplinary talk. And uh, questions from our audience? So you can unmute yourself or input your question in the chat box.
Yeah, I, I think so. Actually, I have several questions. Yeah, so maybe I can ask first. Oh, I think there's some questions in the chat yes. box. Would you yeah, that's that? right. Yeah, I, I think the crypto uh, GCN, so we assume the uh, adjacent matrix is a plain text, but the feature X is a, I mean, is a, a subtext. But uh, uh, in our recent work, so just accepted by Neurops uh, 2023, so we actually uh, relax this uh, assumption. So we, uh, uh, we include both uh, you know, the adjacent matrix and also the features, which means that both A and X are cybertext. I think the audience have a follow-up question. Yeah. Okay, if the sparsity matrix is plain by one party, how about just apply the pick then sum for the matrix multiplication? So it's it's very uh, difficult because uh, question here is that you your feature essentially is a ciphertext, okay? And uh, uh, if you uh, if you involve the ciphertext by uh, you know one is a ciphertext, another matrix is print text. You have to if you want to optimize the I mean the computation. So the state of art method is trying to using the diagonal encoding method to encode the I mean matrix here. So you have to do rotation just as the example I showed before. So diagonal encoding and then you do that and then this can guarantee the uh, I mean results correct. It cannot be done just like a pick then some because remember even it's a, a sparse matrix. No matter it's a ciphertext or plain text, they are all representing the uh, you know coefficient of a high degree polynomial. So it's not just like what we think about. Okay, it's a matrix. Matrix you just to the one row by one column. It's not like that. Okay. So some other questions from the audience. Yeah, I have a question uh, regarding the privacy machine learning. So I have a talk. Um, since we want to protect the user uh, data privacy, can we use an encoder to encode the data and then send uh, the encoded information to the server, like an auto encoder to map it a lower dimension so that information will be secure? Is that yeah, possible? That, uh, I think that's a... Uh, uh... Uh, a good question, but uh, if you just using the auto encoder, you know, to map it in the lower dimension, uh, it's it won't. I mean, uh, keep the privacy because uh, the features still need to be. I mean, even it's lower dimension mapped to the lower dimension, still these features will be learned or will be used during the. I mean the inference stage. So uh, if you think about the uh, uh, included inference, so here the key idea is that uh, the homomorphic inclusion allows the computation directly on the encrypted data. So in this way, only the user has the private key. So the, the client, uh, the cloud does not have this key to decrypt the data. They they are even not able to see the data. So that's a general assumption. So people also argue that why not just using the AES to send the data to the cloud? Then the question is here that if you're using the AES to send it to the cloud, so they are not going to be able to perform the computation directly on the AES included data. They have to do the decryption. Okay, then the user need to share that still your information is leaked. So here, encoding is another way, like you said, right? But still, the feature is going to be used by it. So the general idea is that the client, I mean, the data is not going to be seen by the cloud. So that uh, means the privacy, okay. 
Yeah, and uh, so I have a follow up question. Uh, if we use an encoder and the, the cloud only see the encoded information, so it's lower dimension. So for example, uh, a photo, if we encode it using an encoder, the cloud only see a, a representation in lower dimension. And if the cloud can train directly on that, is that secure enough? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite get, so can you repeat? Yeah. So you're saying that using the encoder is not secure compared to uh, homomorphic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we send the encoded information, the cloud only see the encoded information. Mm -hmm. And if we can train the cloud on that information instead, is that possible? Uh, that's possible. So you can actually train, the, but still the encoder will leak some information of your data. I mean, so eventually what you are sharing with the cloud is, is encoded data. So even it's low dimension, so there is still some way actually you can recover data. So just the regular machine learning, uh, I mean, applications, you have the, you know, the, let's say uh, you have the model inversion attack, right? And now you have a data, okay, you use a model, you can recover the input. Here is the same thing. So if you, even your data is mapped in the low dimension using some of the autoencoder, there is still some way actually the user can, re the, 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 the malicious cloud provider can still use the same machine to reconstruct the original data. Okay, so this is important. I mean, this is, I think uh, you can pro provide some sort of, I mean, the privacy, but really it's not the, uh, I mean, the optimal solution. So that's what I will say. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. answer my question. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the audience? Uh, hi. Uh, just a quick question. So in the slides, I see that uh, multiple. Uh, this is for the graph neural networks. I see that the feature maps are ciphertext, but the model is plain text. Is that correct, or both of them are ciphertext? Uh, uh, the feature map of the cyber tax, uh, uh, yeah, the feature map is a cyber tax. But the model is plain text? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the assumption we have. Otherwise, we are not going to be able to use in the sparsity because we have to, you know, have the uh, sparsity information. So that's why we actually assume here in this assumption, we assume the data is uh, a cyber tax and the model is plain text, but when the data goes to the model to the inference of the first layer, so ciphertext by uh, plain text is still like ciphertext. So basically each layer feature map ciphertext, but the weight is a plain text. Okay, uh, so the cloud can actually get the first layer uh, model directly, right? Since you're not securing that. Uh... Yeah, that's right. So here we actually do not encrypt with the model. So. Uh, our assumption is that the the, uh, uh, the user want to protect that data, but the model provider we don't involve that. We assume that either the model actually, you know, belongs could be uh, could belong to the cloud infrastructure provider, right? right? Something like that. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, so if no more questions, I have I have some quick questions. Just two questions for would you? So first one, so so you mentioned about the, your current work using the in the, for the HE based scenario, and I was wondering, so have you ever considered furthermore, like how about to investigate your approach, extend that in the FHE scenario? And uh, that's a good question. So there are, I think, a different, I mean, approaches. So FHE, so definitely you have to think about, uh, you know, there are other methods like TFHE and other things. So one thing actually we are thinking about the CKKS first is a state of art, I mean, level the HE. So what we believe at this moment is that uh, using the bootstrapping is kind of impossible. So uh, at least at this stage, and it's also confirmed by like Microsoft, they have their own group, Microsoft, the CEO library is developed by them. 
So they have the hard time to deal with that. On the other hand, the level the you know HE like CKKS is kind of very fast, state of art. And we also believe that there could be many possible applications for it. For example, graph neural network. If you look at the industry's graph neural model, so uh, recommendation system, usually it's not too deep actually. It may be just several layers, but the feature and the metric size could be very large. So in this case, if you do not involve the bootstrapping, that's possible that this kind of technique can be used for such scenarios. Uh, on the other hand, we actually have some new research ongoing, try to you know uh, marriage this uh, you know CKKS based like a, like a, uh, with other techniques. Try to take advantage the both advantage of those different inclusion methods. So try to address this issue. I think a solely HE solution is difficult. So that's my perspective. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Look forward to your new research results. And and another question so, 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 before I wrap up the today's the, so so in your talk you you discussed that the results like in the graph neural work and the 3D convolutional works and like, especially for the sparse case. And I was wondering because right now for those the privacy preserving machine learning, I think a, a very big potential application is that using those the, the transformer models that in the cloud, right? And yes. so how about do you expect so the first extension of your approach to those transformer-based computation pad pattern? Yeah. So we, we actually think about this. So for one thing, so there are already some people actually working that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, here is the thing. Just like a few years ago, we talking about emerging memory, right? Mm -hmm. So you never see that in the market. So here, the thing is that the large language model, you know, fine tuning and the training is already very expensive. Of course, we can think about ways that think about the privacy preserving for that. But even in the plain text domain, you do the computation, it's too com costly. So of course, it's very interesting that we can think or rethink about, let's say, because you have, you know, different metrics and encoding and decoder structures. And also you can rethink about the information encoding and as part of those things we can make work. But on the other hand, uh, we think it's still a long, Way to go. So first, let's address the efficiency in the plain text first, and then yeah. let's move forward. Of course, we can do some toy examples, try to demonstrate some idea. But in the long term, I think it will be difficult. Of course, uh, LLM is an ideal case because it's performed in the cloud anyway. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. And also, uh, let's thank our speak Professor Wen again for this very excellent talk and also thank everyone for attending our this week's seminar talk and uh, see you next week. Okay. Thank you, Wujie. Okay. See you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.